What's up, Salt Strong Nation? Joe Simons, like diamonds. Who else we got here today? We got Luke Simons, like diamonds. Not not quite as high pitched as you there, Joe. But like yeah. diamonds. All you have to do <laughs> is just squeeze. Uh, who else we got here? Tony Acevedo, not like diamonds at all. <laughs> <laughs> like avocado. Like avocado, yeah. Get that a lot, guys. It's good to have you back on the show. Before we get into this sure. weeks, or not weeks, we're doing multiple week now, I believe. Before we get into today's episode, all about lure and bait size, if you want to go fishing with us, we have a free trip and it is still open. So assuming you're still listening to this, in the month of September 2019 is a free giveaway, a fishing trip for two, for two days, we're probably going to go to a cool little secluded island and do it upright. This is not going to be like, hey, let's go wet a line for an hour or two. This is going to be an experience for two. And right now, there's only like a few hundred people in this giveaway. Like the chances are really high to win. This is not like winning the lottery, even though the value is probably just as high and debatable. <laughs> but all you have to do is go to iTunes and find the Salt Strong Fishing Podcast when you're listening to or watching on YouTube right now and leave a review, preferably five-star, and then take a screenshot of it, and then email it to us at fish at saltstrong.com, and we will automatically put you in the giveaway. We will be choosing a winner in early October. You do have to be 21 years or older. You do have to live in the continental United States, and you have to enjoy fishing. That's it. Besides that, anybody can, uh, can win. You don't have to be one of our insider members or anything like that. And as uh, so once again, iTunes, we're trying to build up our reviews. We're trying to blow this podcast out the roof. We're having so much fun doing it and trying to get a lot of better guests. And one of the big, the things that helps us out the most to be found in iTunes to help us grow and get better guests are the reviews. So you help us out tremendously and get a chance to win a trip with us. So that's all I have to say on that. Let's get into this episode. Gents, we had a lot of questions come up about lure selection in terms of size. We talked about color before in the past. Uh, I don't think we've ever done one on, on size. And, you know, we now have three different versions of the Slam Shady with Z-Man because of this, because there's not one size that's always going to win. Uh, a lot of people have probably heard the whole match the hatch. We're going to kind of go into that and talk about how relevant that is and, and how to do it in the best way possible because it's not it's not just perfect science and uh and then answer you know some other questions and kind of and mistakes that have come up along the way with lure selection size so who wants to go first luke tony yeah i guess i'll start it off and uh, the just to start off with like the the high level premise in in the fact that you know that size obviously does matter and you know fish are generally looking for you know like the, the silhouette is generally what they see they don't see color quite as easily like, you know think about if you're if you're on the bottom and if you're you know swimming in the water and you're down and you're looking up especially if the sun's up right like the, all you see is a silhouette like this the sun is based like the, the bottom of the bait is basically black because no like lights not hitting it so long story short the silhouette is very very important and um, yes you know the, uh, one size can work all year long like the three inch three inch baits why why I use them for many, many years throughout the entire season is because they can catch fish all year, all year long. Um, but what I found once I started going to bigger baits during the, the late summer uh, and then especially in the fall, when that's when the bait fish are biggest, um, that's generally when I started catching bigger fish more consistently is that I was basically, I finally started matching the silhouettes of my, of my lures to the most prevalent bait during that time, if that makes sense. So generally winter and spring, the bait fish is the smallest. So that's generally what those fish are looking for. And then the, you know, late summer, fall, the, a lot of big, the big bait fish around and bigger is generally gonna be the, the best way to catch the bigger fish. So why, why is that? Why are bait fish smaller in those two seasons and bigger in the other two? I don't know, because that's just a life cycle. I've never really studied the bait fish, but, um, but it, yeah, it's uh, just, just what, um, yeah, it's generally been the case. And it's kind of like the winter time. The, that's why shrimp are, are often a lot better during the winter because the bait fish are just less prevalent altogether. 
Um, but it seems like at least around here in Central Florida and even, uh, you know, Captain Peter Deeks in the in that course we did with him on, on live bait. And I mean, it's, it's pretty – it sounds like it's pretty standard across all regions is that that's the general – the general size changes uh, across the seasons. Yeah, it seems like um, the bait pretty much hatch in the spring. Then they have pretty much all summer and fall to grow. So by the end of the year, they're at their biggest from what I've seen. I'm telling you right now, we need to get an expert on bait fish on this joint pronto. Here we do. <laughs> it's a cool I'm thing about fish. There's always something new to learn. I've never seen so many guesses in all my life. <laughs> <laughs> Except for me, last time I went fishing trying to pick out a good spot. So. <laughs> All right, cool. So that's the general idea is match the hatch. Talk, like, what does that mean? What does match the hatch mean for those that have never heard of that before? Well, well, it comes from fly fishing. It's the hatch of flies, and so you match whatever's hatching at the time. Um, but the same premise is across the board with fishing. Um, so it's literally just match whatever's in the water, match it as close as you can. In general, I mean, if I'm if I'm not fishing, and 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 the whole you know the the fall is the biggest. It's it's a generality. It's not always the case. If I'm out, even right now, it's uh, it's fall. It's the time where the bait the bait is generally the biggest. But if I'm out and I'm just seeing a bunch of glass minnows, and and that's what that's the only thing that's there, then I'm going to go small, right? I'm I'm going to I'm just going to assess that okay, right now in this given spot at this given time, I'm seeing smaller bait. So I'm going to go small. I like to get a little bit bigger than what's there, but I like to get close um, in, in the same, but I would start with a bigger bait because the odds are going to be that the, the most bait in, in the general area are going to be big. But if I, if I'm actually in the water and I see something different even in the fall, if I see small bait fish, I will go from the bigger bait that I started with and I'll just go down, a, go down a size. And if using, even the using um, soft plastics, which I, which I love using, I'll, instead of like switching baits, I'll literally just tear off, like an inch or two of the tail. If I have a five inch jerk shad on, I'll tear off two inches of the tail and just use the nub because that nub is now the right silhouette. And, uh, and I've caught some of my biggest fish on, on just like pieces, like halves of, uh, of soft plastic, which is one reason I love soft plastic. You can, you can change the size of your, of your lure really fast without having to retie or anything. I wonder, uh, I wonder why it, this whole match the hatch you know, think about it. So it, let's just say your example of a bunch of little glass minnows and stuff, got a bunch of small bait. You would think those fish, if they're hungry, they're feeding on it and they saw something really big come through there. They'd want to inhale that, right? Like if I'm at a, looking at a little salad bar and there's all these little small pieces of lettuce and all of a sudden I see a big hamburger, I'm going for the big hamburger, the big steak, right? Uh, why, why is that? Why, why, why wouldn't you want to stand out and be the opposite of what's there? Just playing devil's advocate. Well, well I think so. If, if, what would you start out with? If you saw something, you saw a hamburger, if you were a bunch of French fries, yeah, just, you know, even just a small pieces of lettuce, just kind of something boring. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah. I'm not going to fill me up, but I'll eat it. Yeah. But, but if you, if you've been eating that, if you're hungry and you've been eating that lettuce and it's just super easy to eat, right. It's just right there, right in your face. And like, you're, you're just, you're just, I, you're, you're hungry the lettuce is there. You're already eating it. You like it. And it's just, you're, you're just already eating. That's, that's what you're looking for. Like when you're looking around, you're just looking for, Hey, where's the next little piece of lettuce? I'm going to come grab real quick. At least that's my, that's my, uh, my philosophy on it. Cause I've, I've done in many, obviously sometimes they will eat the bigger bait. This is just, uh, you know, uh, statistically sometimes, when the, especially when those fish are finicky, they're keyed in on just one thing. And if you don't give them that, that thing, if you don't, if you don't represent, whatever that thing is, you won't, you won't get striked. Kind of like when we were in Sebastian Inlet, that one, uh, that one after filming that time, Joe, and those, uh, the crab run was going on. If we didn't have a little small crab, that was the, the perfect right size. We weren't cutting, we weren't hooking anything. But if we, as soon as we did, it was game on with just big giant redfish. So it's not always the case, but you know, the statistically it, it's generally smart to, to match whatever's there. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, the like those redfish, for instance, I mean, they're, they know that bait is there, to your point. They love it, and that's all they're thinking about. Every time they're going by and kind of putting their eyes up at the, at the top, they're looking for that crab pattern, and they're probably – and they not just probably, they were ignoring everything else that was thrown at them. Uh, makes sense. Tony, you going to refute that? No, I was going to say matching the hatch. I definitely agree with that. 
but to the point where you're matching the profile and the size of the bait. And then the color is what helps that bait stand out from the crowd. So if you're fishing a big school of mullet or a big school of thread fins, you want something that matches the size of that bait, but you, maybe you want to have something with a little bit of red in it because red basically simulates what a bait fish looks like when it's either weak or injured or dying. As you notice with mullet or any bait fish, if you have in the live well, if they start to get weak and tired and they're about to die, uh, their head usually turns red, their fins turn red, and that's what those fish are looking for. They're looking for the weakest one out of the group because it's the easiest meal. So if you have a bait or lure that matches the size of those bait fish and it has something that either stands out or also your retrieve, if it is a erratic retrieve and it stands out, shows that that bait fish is weak and easy to eat, those fish are going to dial in on that. You are the weakest link. Goodbye. Whatever happened to that, whatever happened to that chick? Is that show still going on? I'm not sure. I haven't watched TV in a while, to be honest. I'm not sure. Yeah, even if I did, that's probably the last show I would watch. <laughs> but not, no offense to anyone who's still watching that show or reruns of that show. Let us know if you know what happened to that lady. You are the weakest link. Good boy. All right, so let's talk about – Let's. I, I think it's helpful to go through seasons. So right now – this is late September-ish, getting in October, what most would consider fall. We've all agreed that baits are bigger, and here in Florida, we got the mullet run. I mean, mullet runs in many places, but uh, this time of year, it's starting to happen on the east coast of Florida. What are you guys? This is the time you're going big, and if so, how big? What when you know when someone says, "Oh yeah, I'm moving up a size," you go on five inch, twenty inch. How how big of a, of a of a bait you moving up to? A hog leg like our boy Lunker Dog? Yeah, I mean uh, it's really about what you're looking for. But yeah, I mean as far as uh, you know, as far as live bait, yeah, just catch whatever's there is generally going to work the best. And uh, but as with artificials, I'm I'm not. I just go to five inches, kind of what I go with. Like I like this the paddle tail for those on on YouTube can kind of see. This is what I've been having the best luck with lately. It's just a five inch paddle tail. I rig it on the, on a weighted hook. For fish in the shallows this basically just runs just like maybe six inches under the surface a little bit deeper if i go slow but uh but it runs under the water above the oysters above the seagrass and it's just easy pickings uh for these this is what i caught that that big snook on that you know that little, little over 40 inches just hit this basic lure just doing a straight retrieve let the paddle tail do the work and uh and there was a lot of mullet in that area that were about the same size and so I was basically just resembling what those, uh, you know, what that snook was surely in there uh, feeding. I caught a big redfish too uh, there the next morning. Again, same bait, just a simple retrieve. I just kept a simple, easy little bait there and, uh, and surprisingly uh, effective. So I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to do it the right way. If you missed one of our most recent episodes, we, we kind of poke fun at most people always ask, Hey, where were you fishing? They're trying to get your spot. And, and really the most important part is the trend. And the question is, Hey Luke, what kind of area were you in when you caught that 40 inch snook and the red? Just yeah, so the, the type of spot was, um, it was a point like an outside point along Charlotte Harbor. Um, and oh, I got the, Oh, tell me. Yeah. And, but again, the same premise holds true. This is, you know, this is the time where a lot of the fish are, are moving, you know, especially snook, you know, they go on the beaches during the summer. Uh, a lot of them spend their winters up in the canals. And so right now it's kind of in transition time. So those points are just obvious areas to, uh, to, to focus in on. And so there's this one point where there's been a lot of bait fish on and uh, I just saw a bunch of birds dive in, saw some wading birds and just went up to it and started fishing. It was, how, uh, how deep was it? This was, the snook was in probably like two and a half feet of water. It was pretty shallow. It was just a, a shallow flat with some, uh, with some oysters. And, uh, and, and the, you know, there's again a lot of bait fish around it. And so I was basically just blind casting. I was trying to, the water was real murky. You know, it was, uh, had a lot of rain, a lot of the, the tannic waters coming out. So the water was real dark. It was pretty windy. I even had Otis on the boat. So it was a little chaotic when that snook was on. But, um, but yeah, I was just out there casting and just trying to, trying to pick off whatever was there. And so I, I, I missed a big fish too. It was, I'm sure it was a snook as well, uh, probably about the same size. And then about 10 minutes later, I finally hooked up with the, the one that I caught. Cool. Tony, thoughts on baits right now? Yeah, I mean, it, it highly depends on the type of area. 
Definitely, because if you're on the flats, you might have bigger finger mullet, like let's say in the five to six inch range. But then if you go fish an inlet, you might have to bump it up even more because you have bigger baits, bigger fish. Uh, you're fishing an inlet, you might need to throw a seven, eight, nine, maybe even a 10 inch lure. So it really depends on what type of area you're in. But the general overall premise is that you're using a bigger bait. Uh, if I'm fishing on the flats, I'm typically going with anything from four to six inch bait. And then again, like I said, if I'm out in an inlet, I'm throwing big bucktail jigs or big swim baits. Uh, as you can see, I think I have one here. Yeah, I've got one here. This is a, this is a bucktail jig. And as you can see the entire profile, I mean, it's huge when it's in the water, it looks big. It's about seven, eight inches long. And to me, this doesn't look like a bait fish, but the snook and the redfish love it. I mean, it's all about the profile and the size. So when you are out there, just match your bait size to whatever you see that's out in the water. It could double as a margarita uh, umbrella when you're uh, done and it's dried out too. Yeah, could do that too. Straighten out the hook, stick it in your drink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, th I think to me that's where one of the biggest mistakes happens, right, is everyone – in some of the questions we've received, everyone wants that magic bullet answer, and, and you really just hit it on the head, right? Even though the bait fish might be bigger in, let's just say, fall, it doesn't mean everyone should just automatically use a 5-inch or a 9-inch, you know, uh, swim bait, right? Uh, it all, a lot of it depends on where you are. It depends on the depth, which is why I asked about depth earlier. And I'm guessing, Luke, you would not use that same – five inch is this is five inch one right the Sinan paddler z the slam shady on a weighted owner twist like hook in sebastian inlet right correct yeah a big part of it is yeah obviously a big part of it is size but to joe's point there um you have really have to factor in the actual depth that the strike zone is probably gonna be because there's gonna be a strike zone on just the overall area but then there's gonna be a strike zone in the water column and if uh even if you have the perfect size bait and, and you're on the top of the water, but this, all the feeding is happening on the bottom, which is, which is often the case, um, you're not going to catch anything. And so really, really important is to factor in the size and then off, also the, the depth coverage. Um, so like Sebastian Inlet, generally the feeding is, is down closer to the bottom. Um, yes, there, there are some fish that can be caught on top water, but statistically you're going to catch more fish if you're just buzzing right, just barely off the bottom or bouncing on the bottom if you can without getting snagged. And so, yeah, so doing that lure that, on, that I was using on the flat would be terrible in Sebastian Inlet. I'd probably just be catching a bunch of ladyfish. Um, and so I could basically use that same lure and just put a jig head on it just to get it down, right, to get it down deep enough or even you know, put it on the back of one of those bucktails to make the profile bigger. But, but, yeah, so size is great, but it's not everything. You really have to factor in the actual depth, you know, the depth zone that you want to be targeting and make sure that whatever lure it is, um, I, I would rather have the wrong size bait at the right depth than, than the right size bed at the totally wrong depth. Hmm. So a lot of it's just getting in front of fish's face, to be honest. Let's, let's pivot real quick to shrimp. Shrimp. So shrimp are, you know, probably one of the most popular uh, obviously, you know, live slash dead baits, but they're also incredibly popular. I know, Tony, you, you catch fish, I believe, year round, you know, using some type of shrimp pattern, but it's not like, and maybe I'm wrong. I, I don't use them enough. I use basically just that Berkeley Gulp shrimp and occasionally the Z-Man, and it's pretty much the same size. Like, I haven't seen a three-inch shrimp and a 10-inch shrimp, right? Or, or, or is it out there? Like, meaning, is it as important with the shrimp to change up the size as well? Um. Not that I've noticed, um, like, like you said, shrimp are pretty much around year long. Fish will eat them year long. It really comes down to whether you're using a bait fish profile or a shrimp profile, depending on the time of year. Like for example, Luke touched on this earlier. If you're fishing in the fall, shrimp are more abundant in the fall because the bait fish have, or not the fall, but the winter time, bait fish have kind of dwindled down they're not as abundant so the fish are going to be feeding more heavily on shrimp and crabs and crustaceans more than bait fish so you might have a better shot using a shrimp imitation later in the fall and into winter when it cools down a lot and those bait fish move out so 
that would be my take on the shrimp. Uh, the size of shrimp, they're, like you said, typically finding them anywhere in that three, four, uh, maybe five inch size. But if I was a fish, if I did see a bigger shrimp, no matter what time of the year, I'd probably eat that. Oops. That's just my thinking. <laughs> that needs to come up with a big nine inch shrimp, dude. <laughs> I believe Chase, Chase Bates has a, it's almost a six inch shrimp. It's pretty yeah. big. It's about total size of my hand. You can just it lay like it. Looks like a bait. At least, right? That's yeah. Cool. Have you used that one yet? No, I haven't thrown that one yet. Yeah. I want to get a bigger weighted hook, see if I can throw it in the inlet. You might you might catch the world record cheap side on that, Tony. <laughs> Just might. <laughs> uh, big old shrimp. Um, so what what else? What else in terms of um, changing up size? Like when let's I want to start with you, Tony, because you're out in a kayak a lot. I know you're trying to minimize your tackle. Not that you aren't, Luke. You're a minimalist as well. But Tony, you're trying to have as few things as possible. Do you do you only take a couple different sizes? Do you take you know, a bunch of things when you're going out, what is, what does your tackle look like when you're going out on a, on a normal kayak trip? I pretty much keep my baits anywhere from three to five inches, pretty much all year long. That's what I'll carry with me. Like a three inch gulp shrimp, then a five inch, uh, gulp jerk shad that bait. If you want something to catch fish all year long, pretty much that four to five, five inch range is ideal. Uh, those are pretty much the two baits that I mainly keep with me and also a paddle tail, uh, just so you have something a little bit different. Maybe Again, a slam shady color, perhaps? Yeah, slam shady. Oh, yeah. guess who's back? Been throwing that again. quite a bit. Shady. I actually caught, a, caught that 47-inch red on the three-inch. So not always do you have to go big for big fish. I mean, that fish inhaled that little bait. Elephants eat peanuts. <laughs> that was good. Um but yeah, the three to five inch range, uh, gulp jerk shad, gulp shrimp, and then some type of paddle tail like the minnow Z. Usually all I have with me, maybe a top water, but that's about it. Good. Luke? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I've been keeping it even more simple than that. Um, lately, it, lately, I've just been focused on doing, you know, some lure reviews and lure contests. So I literally just take two. And it's usually like the most recent one was, or the one I just um, just edited and put out was the uh, spoon. So I had a weedless spoon, one versus another, a Johnson, uh, Silver Mano versus Aqua Dream. And so I, I only took those out. So I didn't have any excuse not to use them. It's easy to get out there. And if, if you're on a slow bite, it's very easy to just blame it on the lure. And in many cases, it's just the spot. You know, you're not, um, not in a good spot. And so uh, I actually caught just as many fish per hour than, than normal. And I just, I just had to cover some ground. A couple of spots weren't good. I just moved and sure enough, I uh, started catching fish. So uh, I generally keep, I say, I always have less is more, but I, I will, if I'm fishing like a tournament, I, I will have at least one option for like a three inch, just like Tony, three, a four and a five. And I'll usually, if it's in the summer, I'll start with a four and then I'll maybe move up or down. If I, if I see different size bait in the area, if it's fall, I'll start with the five. And if it's winter or spring, I'll start with the three. So just to keep it like super simple, that's, that's basically the, the methodology that I use. And I spend, I guess I really spend very little time worrying about the lure, to be honest. I spend way more time really focusing on, on the spots. But uh, so the lure side, I try to keep it as simple as possible so that I don't, I don't find myself like spending just too much, too much brain energy on, uh, on trying to find the perfect lure because there's generally not going to be, be one of those. Yeah, that seems to be a, a common trend. I'm seeing a lot of uh, weekend warriors that join the Insider Club. You know, we always ask uh, all new members to, you know, post, you know, a question or a challenge, like something that, that they want to improve upon. We can help them out because we have so much content. We, I think we just blasted through a thousand different like fishing tips that we have on social.com. Like that's a massive library. Some of the stuff that we forgot we even have from like 2015 and it seems like a lot of people, that's one of the first things they say is, hey, here's what I'm using. I'm using, you know, the Z-Man uh, uh, Minnow Z, and I'm using the Berkeley Gulp Shrimp, and I'm still not catching fish. And what we quickly tell them, because we, we basically act as fishing coaches, and so do some of the pros and fishing, like legit fishing coaches on our team. And it's always, hey, like, let's get you in and take this little Finding Spots Mastery course. Let's get you focused on the spot and understanding the trends behind it 
then you get your confidence bait because you still want to have confidence, right? You still want to have that bait that you just like, all right, I'm in a good spot. I'm seeing bait. I'm seeing birds. I got structure. I'm going to catch some fish. But it seems to be like a, a, a pretty big trend I'm seeing recently and, and, and in a good way because that's usually the easiest thing to fix, right? And the people who are the lure lover Larrys, we call them, that just are so transfixed on, oh, I got to have all these different lures and lures are great. I think all three of us here have a lot of lures and I love collecting lures and I love trying new lures out. But at the end of the day, you got to focus on the spot. You got to focus on, on, you know, on really on the trend, on the smart spots, as we talked about on that prior podcast. Definitely. Yeah. When I was doing those tournaments, you know, Nick and I, my buddy Nick and I were doing this tournament series. It was from February all the way till September. And, uh, and we wanted to do it. Um, it was, it was live bait optional. And then, uh, I have a, I really can't stand just sitting there. And so we decided let's, let's just, let's just use lures the whole time. Even like the first term was lures only. Everything else was optional. And we said, let's just, let's just use lures the whole time. And, and what we found is that we, we were just always using the, like a five inch jerk bait in the shallows. And then if it got in deep, deeper zones, it would just be a jig head with, uh, with, the, with a little shrimp pattern. It's like a three inch and a five inch. And then if it was something in between, we would rip off an inch of the five inch to now have a four inch. And so we literally only brought those two types of baits, one color of each, and then we brought some extra jig heads, some extra, um, some extra weighted hooks for the shallows, and totally didn't even bring the tackle box toward the end because uh, one of us, uh, we, were, we were creeping up on a school of redfish, and one of us moved, and the tackle box, it kind of felt, it was almost leaning over, and it fell over and, and scared the whole, the whole school of reds. So we decided at that point, no more tackle boxes. So we just brought like a Publix bag of just extra baits, extra hooks and we just set, we just fished we just covered a lot of ground and we did we did really well we we profited on that whole tournament series and we kept the baits the entire the entire same things across the entire um, I guess that was three seasons so lures are great but yeah I think the most important lesson I've learned over the years is that it's better to be an ex like the retrieve is generally what gets to strike and uh, and it's better to be an expert at retrieving you know, like one or two lures than it is to be just pretty good at using a whole, a whole like tackle store. Um, so, so I, I don't know. I, I think it's better. I, well, generally what I recommend to somebody uh, who's asking, who's having trouble with artificial lures is pick one, pick one that's proven to work and just use it and just make yourself use it. Don't give yourself uh, the ability to even change lures because you'll want to, when you're in a, you're in a bad spot, you'll want to change lures. But the truth is most often that it's just not a good spot for whatever reason. Just go to the next spot, and uh, and generally that's gonna what that's gonna be what what triggers the bite. So I'm curious, and I'm sure the audience is as well. If you guys can recall your biggest snook, redfish, trout, all three, if you can, or even just minimum one or two, and what size lure you caught it on. Like Tony, for instance, you had that 47 inch red. I don't know if that was the biggest redfish you've ever caught, but I know it was up there. Uh, that was on a three inch little slam shady paddle tail. Do you, do you guys recall the memories of, of what I size? Do. Yeah, my biggest redfish was, uh, I didn't have a measure. It was probably mid forties, um, but it was in the Banana River and just got solid big school of reds coming over. And I just, I was using a jerk bait. I was using a four inch DOA, uh, uh, DOA jerk is the name of it with the uh, uh, generally used in the winter time but it's the it's the same lure I caught the stick on the balcony with actually it's the it's the one with the uh, what's the name of it it's like the dark up front and then a chartreuse tail rigged on one of those weighted hooks root beer, root beer. yeah root beer and I caught yeah I caught two of them uh, back to back it was uh, it was awesome I think biggest trout it was you, I got, think on a you got well I guess that was Louisiana maybe that didn't count but those were those were all mid 40 reds um, yeah, but I, I think that the ones uh, I believe the one at the Indian River was bigger. It was a, it was a beast, and it was just it was just me. It was like the I don't know the the ones in Louisiana we had using popping corks. I don't know that was a different. I think I feel like those things would have just eaten whatever was there. Those things were super aggressive. <laughs> and one of my biggest snook was actually the one I caught just recently on this on this five inch slam shady. It was uh, again I don't, my measuring stick only goes to thirty six, but it was a solid four or five inches longer than the measuring stick. And it just hit this this five inch little small paddle tail, and probably biggest trout was on a five inch uh, jerk jerk shad, hmm. or my bullfrog. I've caught a big one on bullfrog too. That was close to thirty inches as well. It's a bullfrog four inches. 
Uh, I think it's three and a half. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, mine's mine's a little bit on the opposite side of the spectrum, actually. The big red that was the biggest on artificial that was on the three inch minnow Z. And then my biggest trout was 30 inches. And that was actually on a root beer colored paddle tail. That was a three or four inch paddle tail. And the biggest snook that I've caught inshore was I believe 34 or 35. And that was on a three inch uh, gulp shrimp. <laughs> it's all small. But yeah. So again, probably most likely dependent on the time of year and the type of baits that are in the area crazy that's, that's interesting two of our biggest fish on artificials were just recent on the new slam shitty baits that's pretty cool yeah These things are working by the way i believe as of today we're at 39 different species caught on slam shady if you're not aware we're trying to break a new world record we're still having trouble figuring out what the world record is <laughs> the species caught is like not document anywhere but we got to be getting close and we will hit it that's crazy because we've only had these things for like 40 days and we're we're basically almost averaging a different species a day and we've had some people take on with some random places like canada and, uh and, and get some random species we never thought would be on there but man pretty cool dude nice yeah instead of breaking nice. them we can make them <laughs> yeah um yeah 40 species who would have thought and that includes freshwater and, and saltwater and a couple you know junk fish still some pretty awesome catches yep i'm slim shitty as i'm uh what else guys um any, any other thoughts or mistakes on on besides the obvious stuff about just not focusing on you know what's more important which would be the, the 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 spot or type of spot you're fishing right to make sure you're in a, in a feeding zone not a dead zone and then you got the more of the retrieval on, on how you're right and then you kind of got the lure and then the colors all mixed in there as well yeah there was a i needed to look this up there was a study that i think it was over in new, new zealand did a study on um on like you know obviously captive fish on what was stimulating the the, the strikes and they were measuring those three factors, the motion in the water, the size, and I think the other one was the, yeah, the color. And, uh, and what they found is that by far the motion in the water was what really triggered the bite. And that's why I said before, it's, it's just really important to get good at, at, at just knowing how to adjust your retrieve to get even a fish that's not like super hungry. Anybody can catch fish those days when they're just fired up. You know, you can go out there and throw anything at them, and, uh, which is awesome. Those days are great. But there's also there's always going to be those days where they're just not they're just not hungry they're they're not aggressive, and uh, and if you if you really get get used to using the one lure and you've you know you've figured out that okay, hey, this is one of those tough days, in many cases there's just like a little small retrieve uh, difference that will actually help them help you get bites. In many cases it's to slow it down right and and sometimes some cases speed it up, but um, but I guess the the key lesson is really focus on the retrieve. And then the second, you know, the, the number two listing in that study was the profile, like the silhouette. Does the size match what they're somewhat interested in? And then the third one was color. So it was interesting to, to see that study, uh, the results of that study basically match what, you know, what we've, we've seen on the water. Uh, however, New Zealanders do drive on the wrong side of the road, and I believe <laughs> toilets even flush the opposite way down there. So, so it, could, it could be flip flop. Yeah, who knows? Flip flop. <laughs> Color might be most important down there <laughs> or up here. Come on, yeah, right? You're left. I, I spent some time in New Zealand, and um, man, we had this bus driver. Never forget the guy, and he was so animated. We were on this bus for like seven hours. And the dude did not stop talking the entire time. Like he loved his job like more than it was awesome. And, uh, you know, he's facing us. We're facing the road and he's got his back to the road because there's a driver and he's just the, the uh, I don't know, the announcer, the, the guy entertaining us all. And the tour guide is the word I'm looking for. And he's like, oh, right over here, my right, your left. Look over here on this side. Oh, my goodness, over here, my right, your left. Yes, it is true that that is an orangutan and only here in New Zealand. Completely not the right animal, but never forget that guy. My right, your left. Oh, 
goodness, look at the size of that one. Oh, you won't see that in America, chaps. <laughs> we'll go back to New Zealand. Pretty good at that. Oh, yeah. Oh, dude, we listened to the guy for seven hours. We were all cracking up in the back. So he, said, he said it every time? Oh, yeah, my right, your left. Like, we didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> he kept saying it over and over again. Oh, little Joey, little kangaroo. Oh, now that's supposed to be in Australia. You realize we don't have any snakes here? Yep, they're all up in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, oh, here's Lake Taupo. Beautiful, beautiful, magnificent Lake Taupo. Filled with glorious trout. My right, your left. <laughs> <laughs> all right Woo. Woo. that's what happens end of the day um guys, what else back to lure side <laughs> i just wanted to add in and, something and about and completely misleading scientific data coming out of new zealand <laughs> <laughs> now, i just wanted to throw in something about uh sight fishing and lure size because if you're sight fishing to a fish if you see a fish in the water and you're trying to throw something at them you don't want to throw a big bulky lure because 99% of the time it's going to spook the fish. No matter what time of the year it is, I always try to go as small as possible or as slim as possible as the profile goes because when you throw a smaller bait, it's going to make less of a splash. That way your bait gets in the water as close to the fish as possible, and when that fish gets close, you can move it, get its attention, and it'll go after it. So as far as lure size goes, keep it in the 3- to 4-inch range or even five inch as long as it's not heavy because you don't want to spook those fish. That's yeah. Good. Another, another thing too, is even on, on the vibration aspect of it. And, uh, it's similar to that. Like, like sight fishing is when, when I, what came to mind. So when sight fishing, you know, fish, it's usually going to be pretty clear water. And so the fish are really relying a lot of their on, on eyesight on actually visually seeing their, their prey and grabbing it. And if it's, if it's somewhere that's, that's really like really vibrating, um, that often spook them off. And the, the story that comes to mind, Joe, is when we were testing out the, um, was it called the twitching lure? Oh, gosh. The one that, that vibrates. That, that was, I don't know if those commercials. Small, it catches them all. Yeah, I don't know if those commercials are still going on, but at the time, they were, they were everywhere. Like, they were ag aggressively marketing these things. And the claim, the promise was you catch, you get a strike every cast or something. And so we were just, okay, we've got we to gotta try these lures out, knowing that it's not going to come true, but maybe they do work pretty well. And, and uh, so we went out, it was out in Tampa, and we both were fishing together. And, and all we brought was that one lure because we, we were doing a review on it. And sure enough, we get to this spot, and there's some, some giant snook just posted up in the shallows. And the water's pretty clear. And I got, I was like, oh man, I, got, I did not want this lure on. I would, if I would have the, like a, a jerk bait, I'm confident that, that the, those snook would have been, at least one of those snook would have been, would have been caught. And so, anyhow, we were throwing these loud twitching lures up to them and just totally, I, I, both of us had good cast to them. I had one, Joe had the other and both of them just totally turned away. They wanted nothing to do with it because it just wasn't natural. Like it was, it was calm water. It was pretty clear and, and nothing, nothing there. It's just not natural for a bait fish to be making all that racket. So like there's no totally. And you don't ever need led lights on your fishing lure. <laughs> for any of you listening do not buy that lure ever i feel so bad because we you know we did that review and we bashed them like we don't ever bash companies but it was a complete i mean it's just misleading to, to i mean they flat out said multiple times in both audio and in text that you will get a strike every single time and they had all these well, they had mullet on there that it had caught and was yeah. like, and it's got LED lights. It's blinking. It looks like a spaceship coming through the water. No wonder I'm like, scared of it. And, but, uh, and, but and murky thought, water, it might work okay. But, uh, but yeah, we actually did. We finally did catch some snook, but we were, we were going through a good area that we would have caught probably like a, a dozen snook on normal lures. And, uh, and so I think because people, like we actually caught some fish with it, you know, a lot of people who saw, our, who saw our stuff on the website actually went out and bought them. And, uh, and, and a lot were disappointed and came to us like thinking that we sold it to him. Like, Hey, no, like we actually kind of said not to buy it. <laughs> um, so anyhow, the, the, the big lesson is, is think about the, the, like how much vibration, how much noise the bait's making noise is great for dirt, for dirty water. Uh, it's not so great for the clear water. Yeah. That brings up another, another point I wanted to mention. Uh, keep in mind that bigger baits are going to push more water, which means they're going to cause more of a pressure change in the water. And fish pick up on that. 
their lateral line. That's where they pick up pressure changes. That's why when storms come through, they could pick up those pressure changes, but they also pick up those changes when something's moving around in the water. So if you're fishing in an area and the fish are very spooky or skittish and it's, let's say right now it's fall, that's usually when you want to be using bigger baits. Try bumping it down to maybe a three or four inch bait with a smaller profile so it doesn't spook those fish as easily as those bigger baits. It's good, man. I'm glad we ended on that and not the my right, your left. Oh, I'm thinking that's going to be in my head now. <laughs> uh, we will uh, we will end it on uh, on that note. I'm already looking at the uh, the time. This was a good one, guys. We will have to do it again. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to us. If you are listening on iTunes, especially, please, please, please go give us a review. Subscribe to us. If it's still in the month of September 2019. We still have this completely free giveaway that you can get into. All you have to do is go to iTunes, Apple iTunes, subscribe, leave a review, preferably five-star, and then take a screenshot of it and email it to fish at saltstrong.com, and we will enter you into the giveaway. And then finally, if you're not part of the Insider Fishing Club, please, please, please join. We have put so much like time, money, fishing coaches into this. Like if you looked at it a year, even two months ago, but especially in the past year, like it is night and day difference. It's why most people, I think 70% of people are renewing it. I mean, many of our originals from three years ago, just like, man, this thing keeps getting better and better and better. Now we have predictive analysis tool that takes all the guesswork out of what day and, and even like the time of day to go fishing. And we're literally telling you, here is your best chance to go out there and absolutely destroy it and maximize your time. And then we have cheat sheets on every, like what we just covered today over 30 minutes. You can look at that in four minutes for our insert club. We have these cheat sheets, bullet points, boom. Here's exactly what depth you want to fish and what lure you want. Um, uh, you know, the, the best tide, the barometric pressure. I mean, every, we have everything you possibly want at your fingertips, even though I know Luke, you're not crazy about barometric pressure, but still comes into, into play. But anyhow, please join us. That's all at saltstrong.com. And we have a one-year risk-free trial. Huh? What? Uh, how do they do that? One-year risk-free trial. That means you have 365 days to make sure you love it. Even if you don't like Tony, even if he grows a mustache and you say, hey, I don't like that Tony guy anymore, you can get all your money back. We don't ask questions. And we do have about 1% of people that ask for the money back. Just being transparent, we do give money back. It's not very often. It's usually one in 100 or 200, but we do give it back for whatever reason. And even if it's just financial difficulty, we only want you in there and we only want to keep your money if you're 100% thrilled and if you're seeing your fishing game transform and if you're just having more fun out on the water. So we'd love for you to join us in the Insider Club at saltstrong.com. Tony, Luke, this has been fun. Good yes, times. Sir. Who wants to go to New Zealand now? I want to, uh, yeah, only if that tour guy's involved. No, oh, we'll find that guy. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably still there doing it. <laughs> Loving every minute. He haven't lost his voice yet. Cool, guys. We be out. Thank you, everybody. See ya. See you.